All right, so Dr. Brahmabhat is our speaker tonight. He is board certified in orthopedic surgery. His clinical interests include complex injuries of the knee and shoulder, such as meniscus surgery, ACL and PCL reconstruction, patellar instability, articular cartilage restoration, rotator cuff repair, and shoulder labral repair. He also specializes in hip arthroscopic surgery and performs knee and shoulder replacement surgery. And Dr. Brahmabhat sees patients at our Willow Grove and Doyle Sound locations. Go ahead, Dr. Brahmabhat, take it from here. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, I wanna thank you all for taking time away from your family to uh, show up for this talk. Hopefully I'll be able to teach you something. Uh, please feel free to uh, ask us questions. Uh, and just like Natalie said, my specialty is sports medicine surgery. Uh, I do a lot of arthroscopic shoulder surgery and knee surgery. Also do hip arthroscopy surgery that not too many people do. And as I get older and my patients get older, I do their knee and shoulder replacements. Um, so uh, let's get this started. We're, we're going to talk about shoulder pain today. It's really, really hard to talk about shoulder pain in a matter of half hour, 45 minutes. Um, so I've picked two big topics that uh, might hit uh, close to home for you guys. Uh, rotator cuff tears is one thing. And the other one is um, a fracture of the shoulder, uh, that which we see often in the office. Um, so rotator cuff tears, we're going to talk about history, we're going to talk about anatomy, classification, treatment, post-operative rehab, and complications. So Codman was uh, one of the first surgeons in 1909 to popularize or even talk about rotator cuff surgery. But it was in 1972 where uh, Dr. Charlie Neer from New York City, who kind of really brought into view uh, what rotator cuff surgery is all about, and uh, how to fix them. And in 2010 is when we transitioned from open rotator cuff repair to arthroscopic surgery by Dr. Burkhart. This is what rotator cuff looks like. Uh, on the right, you see uh, humerus. Uh, these are the insertion site of the rotator cuff. This is the anatomic specimen. This is what it looks like. Uh, more color pictures. And this is what it looks like on a cadaver. This is the supraspinatus tendon. You're looking at it sideways. This is the front of the shoulder. This is the back of the shoulder. This is infraspinatus. Um, so we have four rotator cuff muscles, and we'll talk about it. Uh, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, uh, teres minor, and the subscapularis. This is what it looks like arthroscopically from inside the joint. Uh, the biceps tendon is here. This is the ball of the hum uh, humerus, the humeral head. And this is your rotator cuff. It looks like a cable over here. So that's what it looks like. Basically, to me, history helps me ascertain what is going on with the shoulder. Is it the shoulder? Is it something else? What kind of work they do? Do they have neck pain, any numbness, location of the pain? How long have they had it? Did they have any injuries? On exam, I look for range of motion. Uh, I, I do certain tests. I look, look at their strength. Uh, I look for any atrophy, meaning that has their, have they lost any muscle mass, and look for any uh, problems with their cervical spine. Most people will often say, hey, doc, why am I getting x-rays done? Uh, I have an MRI. Well, this is a normal looking x-ray. This is not a normal looking x-ray. You can see that the ball is sitting so much higher up. And once I see a patient with this x-ray, I can guarantee that they have a rotator cuff tear. And I can also guarantee that their rotator cuff tear is not repairable. So it helps me ascertain which way this uh, patient needs to be treated. This is what an MRI looks like. You can see that this is the ball, this is the socket, here's your rotator cuff coming in, and it stops abruptly, and you can see that there's a gap there, and that's what a rotator cuff tear is. This is what the rotator cuff cut sideways. You can see that the rotator cuff here should be attached all the way out here, has been torn and retracted. How do you treat them? Well, to me, physical therapy works really well. Cortisone injections work well anti-inflammatory medications, but some patients require rotator cuff repair. And like most ailments that I see, I dis divide treatment based on uh, age, what they do for a living, how long they've, have they had it. Uh, I saw two patients today that are 75, 80 years old that have rotator cuff tears. We're not going to rush into surgery. But if a 50-year-old laborer comes in with an acute rotator cuff tear, the, probably the ideal answer for them is surgery. So when do we transition to rotator cuff repair? This is how I position the patients. That's what it looks like. We transition to a rotator cuff repair when they've failed conservative treatment. Have they failed anti-inflammatory medications, physical therapy, cortisone injections, 
they're having night pain, difficulty with overhead activities, difficulty reaching for objects, that's when you say, okay, it's time to consider rotator cuff repair surgery. So I do all my rotator cuff repairs arthroscopically, uh, where this is what the original way of doing it, a single row, and now we tend to do it in a double row fashion, but this is now how I do it, where we interlink our stitches from the medial row and the lateral row, and this is what it looks like. So this is what a shoulder looks like. Um, here's a biceps tendon. You can see that the biceps ten tendon is damaged significantly. You can see that that's the ball and the socket. Just gonna forward this for time issue. And that's the hole in the top up here. That's your rotator cuff tear. That's what it looks like. So now because the biceps is damaged significantly, you can't leave it at that. It's gonna rupture, it's gonna cause pain. So what I do is I tag it with a stitch and then bring scissors and cut the biceps tendon. And you're gonna see what we're gonna to do to the tendon at a later stage. So this is what the tear looks like from a 50 yard line view. Here's your rotator cuff. Here's the ball that it's supposed to attach to. Here's a socket. So we clean up the tear, but what you will see is now I bring in a grasper. And this is what arthroscopic surgery really has an advantage. You get to see clearly as to how to repair the jigsaw puzzle. Is where does the tear go? And that looks pretty good right now. So that's how we're gonna repair it. So I start putting anchors in the bone and then start passing stitches through. And you'll see that a sharp instrument comes in and this is all done arthroscopically while we're viewing it on a TV monitor. And you saw that sharp needle piercing rotated, uh, the suture through and you make multiple passes. And then when you've made multiple passes, now you start deploying the anchors outside and that's what it looks like. So that's what it looks like. And then finish up the repair by tying more stitches down. You'll see a knot coming in, and this is done arthroscopically where we tie a knot down further repairing the rotator cuff. Now we talked about the biceps tendon. So I've drilled a hole in the biceps groove, and that's the degenerative biceps tendon. And you can see that we're gonna, the metal part is just the screwdriver, only plastic is gonna go, so no metal goes inside the shoulder. You have plastic anchors that just came in and that's gonna screw the biceps tendon into the socket that we just created. And that's what it looks like. Occasionally the patients only have what is called a partial tear of the rotator cuff, not a full tear. So why take down something that already looks good, but just a little worn? Occasionally what I'll do is I put a bovine uh, uh, patch. So what that allows us to do is give you collagen to add to your strength of the rotator cuff. The recovery is much quicker and faster. Uh, no anchor, minimal anchors go in. Uh, so uh, at the end of the day, this is a quicker recovery. But if you have a full tear, a little patch is not going to hold it up. Now, there are some patients who've had big tears for a while, never sought treatment, and now that the tear is retracted way out here, now there's no way that the tear is gonna come over here. Therefore, they need what is called a superior capsule reconstruction. And we didn't have this. When I was in uh, training, we did not have this available. This is a new technique that allows us to put a patch inside the shoulder that will act as a rotator cuff. I, I will tell you this, if you can have your own rotator cuff repair, that's what you want. You only get this if your rotator cuff repair is not repairable. So you can see the uh, pictures where we put um, anchors on the socket as well as on the humeral side. And then we measure up a patch on the outside and then shuttle a patch inside the joint and attach it on the inside on the socket side as well as on the ball side, therefore giving you a patch that prevents the ball from going up. So what's the post-operative rehab? Patients are in a shoulder immobilizer for about five weeks. 
Home exercises start at about two weeks from surgery. And then outpatient physical therapy starts at about four weeks, depending, again, this is based on the size of the tear. The smaller the tear, faster the rehab, bigger the tear, I slow down. What are the goals? Uh, passive range of motion for six to eight weeks. Strengthening starts at three months, which is when the rotator cuff is about 50% healed. And then full recovery, I tell all my patients, it can take anywhere from six months to a year to recover from. Complications. I, I, I will tell all my patients that there isn't a surgery that does not have complications. Luckily, this is done arthroscopically, has less chance of infection, but stiffness can happen. Why? Because we put people in a sling for about four to five weeks after surgery. So stiffness, therefore, physical therapy is important. But I would rather take a little stiffness than a retear, because once you have a retear, you're starting the whole process again. So what does a retear look like? Here's an MRI that shows that here's a ball. Sorry, here's a ball in a socket and the anchors are still in the bone, but the rotator cuff is torn and sitting way out here. So patient had a retear. So this is a good patient that would benefit from the superior capsular reconstruction. And that's what this picture looks like. So you go and do this patch, but sometimes even that's not feasible and you do what's called a reverse shoulder replacement. You'll get to see a video later on, but that's what they need. Transitioning to proximal humerus fractures, I will tell you that this is just 5% of all fractures, but it's increasing in frequency. This is the third most common fracture due to osteoporosis. We all hear about hip fractures and distal radius fractures. Unfortunately, 50% of these fractures are displaced. You can see in this picture that the ball has completely fallen off the humerus here. To me, when I see a patient with a proximal humerus fracture, I give the analogy of an ice cream on a cone, and here the ice cream has kind of fallen off the cone. You can see that the socket is not damaged, it's just the ball. Why do we care about fractures? And this is something that we, 80% tend to be women. Majority are over the age of 65, and the incidence is rising. And surgical indication is going up as well. This is a good slide for people to look at because as our patients are getting older, at the age of 65 and plus, one out of three people will have a fall each year. Over the age of 72, fall every two years. And then at a certain age, you get a fall every year. So these fractures are gonna happen more and more often. 90% live at home by themselves. And then the, they have these fractures and now all of a sudden life changes. What are the four parts? You have the humeral head, you have the greater tuberosity, which is where the rotator cuff attaches to, lesser tuberosity where the rotator cuff attaches in the front, and this is the rest of the proximal humerus. So the glenohumeral joint, we've already talked about rotator cuff attachment, supraspinatus, subscapularis. This is where the biceps travels in the middle. That's what the ball in the socket looks like. But there's also blood supply. So when you saw that first, first extra where the ice cream had fallen off the cone, when those fractures have jagged edges, you can have an injury to this blood vessel. You can see that 64% blood supply to the humeral head is supplied by this blood vessel, the posterior humeral circumflex. So when the ice cream falls off the cone, in that process, the blood supply is torn. So trying to put that ball back is not gonna heal so well. So you have to start talking about shoulder replacement surgery. There's also lots of nerves. Whenever I see a patient with a fracture of the shoulder, say a fracture dislocation, I always do a good nerve exam because 40% of these patients will have some sort of nerve injury. Some may have less, some may have more. The good thing is that most fractures are amenable to conservative treatment. Patients must understand uh, their expectations, but they also have to comply with the program. My typical treatment is sling for four weeks followed by physical therapy. We get x-rays on, on every two weeks to make sure that the fracture is healing nicely and it's not displacing any further. But there are certain fractures that don't do well with conservative treatment. And those are the patients that you have to start talking about surgery. So if you see fractures with less than one centimeter displacement, they don't, they don't need to have surgery. But when do you say that 
non-surgical management is contraindicated. When they have a fracture that will block range of motion, there's considerable displacement of fractures. And we talked about the blood supply that if, if the blood supply is damaged, you can have what's called osteonecrosis where the bone may collapse and greater than five millimeter displacement. So there is a good study that was done that showed that if you look at patients who have three to four part fractures, if you look at surgical versus non-surgical treatment, most patients tend to do well with conservative treatment. So I often tell these patients, try conservative treatment first, especially if they're elderly. And if that fails, we can always do things at a later date. Nothing has to be rushed into surgery today. Now, if you have a younger patient, they tend to do better with plates and screws, and I'll show you pictures of that. So why should we talk about conservative treatment? To make sure that the humeral head is located. There's contact between the head and the shaft. There's less than 20 degrees deviation of the fracture fragments. The joint lining is okay itself, and less than five millimeters tuberosity displacement. What are the surgical options? We can do internal fixation, which is just percutaneous pins, we can do plates and screws, or we can do arthroplasty, which is joint replacement, partial joint replacement versus reverse shoulder arthroplasty. This is a young kid. You can see that the ball has fallen off the cone. The ice cream has fallen off the cone. This is a CAT scan shows you how severe the fracture is. But a young man, especially this is a young kid because the growth plates are wide open. You can see that that's the growth plate right there. So you reduce the fracture and put two pins across and patients will have a good outcome. Unfortunately, this cannot be used for an 85-year-old person where their bone quality is poor. You try to hold the fracture with two pins, that's not going to work. So what's the answer for them? A locking plate and screws where you have 90-degree screws, which will hold the humerus better. And, but we can still have complications where you can have the screws cut out you can see that the bone collapsed and the screws are not holding the bone anymore and it's collapsed over here. Dr. Brahmabad, I think we, we might have lost you. Your screen froze. I don't know if you can hear us. Sorry, everybody. It looks like Dr. Brahmabad may have gotten kicked off. You know, we have these technical issues. Oh, here he is. I lost. Hey, we lost you. <laughs> He's back. All right. Let's see if I can pull this up. Yeah, you just have to share your screen again. <clears throat> Do you see it? No, you have to share it at the bottom. If you hover over on Ring Central and then you see how it's shared. Yep. Good. There we go. Good. Yep. All Sorry. good. Sorry about that, guys. So I know this video is a little long, but I want you to see what surgery looks like. This is the incision for a reverse shoulder replacement. Um, so to the left is the deltoid muscle. And usually when we do a typical shoulder replacement for arthritis, it's not so bloody, but this patient had a fracture a, a few days ago. So there is bleeding from the fracture site. So obviously a little bit more bloody. That's the biceps tendon. So we'll tag that like we did before arthroscopically. This is done open. And now what we're trying to do is find those pieces, the four pieces that we talked about and you tag it with a stitch. 
And that's the humeral head that was broken. And that's what it looks like. So we'll be able to get bone graft from that at a later stage. That's the biceps inside the joint. Now you can see the socket. I'm going to prepare the socket for what's called a base plate. So that's what the base plate looks like. We're gonna put a few screws on. And now we put a ball on top of it. So typically the ball was supposed to be on this side. Now we got a ball on the opposite side. That's why we call it a reverse shoulder replacement. And now we're putting a socket on the ball side and therefore the reverse. Now that's a trial. And if it looks acceptable, that's when we transition. And this has to be cemented cement as a bone cement as a grout because of the quality of the bone. So that's what it looks like. And that's when we repair the rotator cuff that is attached to those fracture pieces. Put the bone graft that you saw me do that, tie sutures down. And that's what it looks like in the end. And that's the, the patient that I operated on. Looks like here's the ball on the socket side, better for reverse. And this is the stem going down the arm. You can see that it goes down straight down the pike. So this is another example. You can see that the bone is broken into so many pieces, we call it a comminuted fracture. Can't put plates and screws for that. That's not gonna hold. So rather do one surgery and make sure you give them a good, good result. So if you look at uh, studies, patients with surgery tend to have reoperation, understandable. But as we try to look at patients who have reverse shoulder replacement, RSA, outcomes are substantially better. Results are predictable. I think that's it. I, I wanted to spend more time with questions and answers uh, rather than to just keep talking. Uh, I want it to be a two-way street here. Feel free to ask me any questions. And, and just because it's a shoulder topic, I don't want you to think that you, can, you can't ask me about knees or hips. Uh, feel free to ask me and I'll, I'll gladly answer those questions for you. All right, we did have two questions come in, so I'll go with the first one. <clears throat> I had frozen shoulder beginning about a year ago. After PT and two cortisone shots, things are much better now in the shoulder. However, now I have pain in my upper arm when I move the arm outward or rotate the arm. What is going on? So a couple things. Uh, number one, frozen shoulder is where your joint lining ought to be paper thin. Yours has gotten thick like a pair of denim pants. And if you saw arthroscopically that the most of the tissue was pristine white material. If I were to put a camera inside your shoulder, it'd be red, beefy looking, inflamed, irritated. So once you've had a frozen shoulder, you have a high chance of getting a repeat frozen shoulder. And uh, without going into medical issues personally for you, but who tends to get frozen shoulders? People who have diabetes, people who have thyroid issues, women more so than men, and patients around 40, 50 years old. They're, they're the ones who are going to get it. So if you tend to not have diabetes and th thyroid issues, you tend to do much better with conservative treatment. I would say to you, I rarely tend to operate on people who have frozen shoulder. They tend to do well with conservative treatment. My uh, spiel to my patients is that this is a self-limiting problem. It's going to get better on its own. And if you wait, nothing bad's going to happen. If you have a rotator cuff tear and you don't, don't have surgery done within a certain time, 
the tear may get bigger and may not be repairable. That's not the case here. So you have all the time. So most likely from what you're telling me, looks like you are having a recurrence of your frozen shoulder. Consider a repeat uh, cortisone injection. But one thing I would add is sometimes there's a reason why people get in a frozen shoulder. They may be having a rotator cuff tear that's causing the pain. Pain is causing a frozen shoulder. So an MRI may not be a bad idea, especially if you have had two cortisone injections already. Okay. I have both neck and shoulder pain for many years. Can both play off of each other? Can you have uh, both neck and shoulder surgery? What was the last class? Sorry, Natalie. No, it's okay. He, he said, um, I have both neck and shoulder pain for many years. Can both play off of one another? Can you have both neck and shoulder surgery? Uh, I, I, you know, as a guy who's been doing shoulder surgery for the past 15 years, I see patients uh, that my spine surgeons did their spine surgery, neck surgery, and then they need shoulder surgery or vice versa. But it is important to figure out what is coming from the shoulder, what is coming from the neck. My typical answer to patients is, if I move your shoulder around and it causes pain, that's coming from the shoulder. If you have pain while you're seated there. You were saying about the, both the neck and, and shoulder surgery and pain. So I would say that, you know, at the end of the day, it, both things can happen, can coexist. One may irritate the other one. You need to be evaluated. Typically, I'll say, if I can cause your shoulder pain by doing range of motion, then, then this is emanating from the shoulder. If you're having issues with your shoulder pain, especially if I move your neck, that's probably coming from your neck. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You need to- um, Is there a way to prevent frozen shoulder? I have had this three times. Uh, maintain your range of motion. That's, that's the best thing. Uh, in terms, I will always say no pain, no gain is BS. When that applies to strengthening, but stretching pain is okay. So keep working on your range of motion. Okay. I had rotator cuff repair quite a few years ago. I fell last year and noticed a weakness in that arm after the fall. It has gotten better with exercise, but is not back to where it was. Should I see a doctor? Yeah, I, I think if you had a rotator cuff repair in the past, I have to be, uh, I, I'll be honest with you that when we repair rotator cuffs, it heals by scar tissue. Uh, it, they tend to work really well, but it's never as good as God nature made it for you. So yes, you can have a re-tear. So the best thing is to get an MRI, especially an MRI would die. You tend to pick up the tear much better. Okay. Somebody asks, how do cortisone, how do cortisone shots work? Good questions. To me, uh, cortisone injection is an anti-inflammatory agent. So the mode of action is no different. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. I can see you and hear you. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, cortisone injection works very similar to what anti-inflammatory medications such as Advil, Motrin, or Aleve does. But the difference is that when we do a cortisone injection, it goes to the shoulder or the knee directly. So you don't have an escape. So when you take Advil or Motrin, some goes to the right shoulder, some goes to the left shoulder. So you get much bigger bang for your buck with a joint injection directly, and you tend to do better with it. Okay. I had frozen shoulder surgery two months ago and my pain has not improved and I still have limited range of motion. Please help. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, number one, I, I think you ought to know, figure out that why was the surgery done? Was it just frozen shoulder alone? Was it done arthroscopically? Did you have the capsule? So we talked about joint lining. When I do the surgery, um, I had surgery two months ago and pain has not improved. So we have to figure out based on the MRI, did, was there any rotator cuff damage or not? And typically when I do your surgery uh, or when I do surgery on a uh, frozen shoulder, I'll release the joint lining circumferentially arthroscopically. And I tend to do these surgeries earlier in the day uh, so that you can go to physical therapy later that evening so you don't get scar tissue. Because what's gonna happen is that when you tear scar tissue, you're gonna bleed into the shoulder and develop more scar tissue. So you have to prevent that from happening. Sorry, I have had pain in my shoulder and I can no longer execute a deep push up or slap plank. Elbow planks are difficult and some yoga moves downward dog are unpleasant. I have been told I need a replacement and if I continue overhead lifts and exercise, it is similar to driving on a bald tire. I am 68, very active, but replacement is a big step. Any other options? Yeah, I think what you could do is a couple things. Uh, I, I 
tell my patients arthritis is a patient decision, never a doctor decision. You are going to know when the timing is right. And um, if you say to yourself that this is not the right thing for me, you hold off as long as you want to. You can have cortisone injections. When you have severe arthritis, if you've been told you have severe arthritis, physical therapy may not work that well because it may actually aggravate the shoulder. I am a firm believer in therapy for certain things. When, when you have severe arthritis, you can occasionally grind bone and bone and cause more pain. So you ought to be careful with that. The other thing is I would say to you that there are other options. Rothman offers PRP injections, which is you take uh, your blood, spin it down and get the good stuff inject within the shoulder. You could do that. Um, that can help you. Uh, there is some off-label use of uh, lubricating injections that people have had in their knee, uh, but you have to uh, take take that uh, for yourself if you want to try that. And and Advil anti uh, anti-inflammatory medications help, and a little activity modification also works. Okay, might be a similar question, but I've had rotator cuff issues for around thirty years now. I'm sixty three, and both injuries from physical activities. Recently, I had a significant flare-up. I went to Rothman Urgent Care and got a cortisone shot. I also had one about seven or eight years ago, which seems to have helped and have just started PT. These shots seem to have helped, but will this continue to happen? Is cortisone and PT the right answer versus surgery? Is there a longer-term answer? So I think if your last injection prior to the recent one lasted you for so long, there's no harm in repeating the same treatment. Um, but if this happens, say within two months, your pain starts coming back, probably a good idea to get uh, be seen in the office, get an MRI done, make sure we're not missing anything. Okay. Why the reverse shoulder have, why does reverse shoulder have better results than total shoulder replacement or does it have better results? That's a better question. I, I'm not sure if that's, that's the case. I, I think if you do an anatomic total shoulder replacement, I did one on Tuesday on an appropriate patient, in my, in my opinion, they do extremely well. Uh, reverse shoulders do great for people who need it. Uh, if you try to do a reverse shoulder in a 50-year-old patient, that patient's never going to do well in the end. So that patient will do better off with the anatomic total shoulder replacement. So I think you have to pick and choose the patient uh, for uh, age. What is the issue with the patient? But uh, yes, we're doing more and more reverses as time goes on. Okay. Does stem cell replacement work to fix shoulder tears? Good question. So uh, if you have a tear where the, here's your ball, and from the socket comes the four rotator cuffs as if you're holding onto a baseball. If the tear, if you have a hole in the rotator cuff, no stem cell, no PRP is going to bring the tear back. You need a repair or you learn to live around it. Okay. Please summarize the recovery timeline for reverse shoulder replacement. Sling, driving, showering, full recovery. So surgery takes about an uh, hour and a half to a couple hours. You stay overnight, and then you go home the next day. You're in a sling for about anywhere from two to four weeks, uh, depending on why you're having the reverse done. Um, physical therapy starts about two to four weeks. Um, by three months, I would like you to high-five me. Um, at three months, you're about 50% healed. Uh, and then you continue to make progress all the way up to nine months to a year from surgery. But in terms of playing golf, I say uh, three to four months you're playing golf. Okay. This is, um, what online study resources would you recommend for a PA student going into ortho shoulder subspecialty soon? Best question of the day. I think uh, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons is a great website for uh, a PA to look at and even patients. So. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons has come up with a website, orthoinfo.org. And you can look up about reverse shoulders. You can look up anatomic shoulders, knee surgery, hip surgery, neck surgery. Great, great website to look up stuff with pictures and uh, some written information. The other websites are, uh, you know, uh, company websites uh, for the PA student. I would prefer they go on a website that's by the academy. Um, so that's what I, the American Academy for Orthopedic Surgeons is a great website for patients. Okay. Are you saying that hyaluronics can be used for shoulders? My issue is biceps tendonitis and arthritis. For arthritis, yes, not for biceps tendonitis, but people who have severe arthritis are usually older. And as you get older, you can have some tendonitis associated with it. 
So hyaluronic, but it's off-label use. So I think you have to figure out if that's the right thing. Randy Johnson, we all remember Randy Johnson, the uh, baseball uh, fastball pitcher. He used to get that. And I've tried that on certain patients and they really like it. Unfortunate thing is that the insurance company will not pay for it. So you have to be uh, understanding of the costs that come with it. That was the last question, except somebody did ask, since this is being recorded, will, will I email it to you? Yes, you will receive a, um, a recording of the, of the presentation within a few days. All right, something came in the chat, let's see. Okay, just... somebody did ask, can you talk about ultrasound guided steroid injections and, is, and if it's necessary? Uh, I, I think that's, that, to me, shoulder. yeah, uh, to me as a surgeon, if I cannot put a needle in the right spot and do a cortisone injection, I, I think that's, that's, to me, that's a problem. And, but yeah, is it, is it the right thing for everybody? If you go to an ER and you expect an ER doc or a PA to give you an injection in the, inside the joint, they don't do that for a living. So that would be hard for them. But if you are comfortable with your surgeon and they feel very comfortable doing this, I do intra-articular injections all the time. And in fact, once I put, especially for patients that we've heard a lot of questions about frozen shoulder, I'll put the needle in, inject the steroid and ask them immediately because there's a lidocaine in it. Hey, did, do you feel any better? They say, yeah, doc, this is awesome. So you know that the lidocaine was in the right spot, the steroid was in the right spot. So you got relief immediately. Okay. Um, with the frozen shoulder surgery that I had two months ago, is it possible that I need, would need another surgery? The first was to release the capsule and for, um, lysis of adhesions. Yes. yes. So no, I think you've had the right surgery done. I definitely would not rush into a second surgery, uh, soon. And they probably took good pictures while you were in the operating room to see, look at the quality of the rotator cuff. So you should look at that and see, hey, was there any damage to the rotator cuff? And then look into the medical issues. Do you have any thyroid issues? Do you have diabetes? Those things play a role because patients who have diabetes tend not to do well with either conservative treatment or surgical treatment for frozen surgery. Okay. Um, Injection formula. Oh, you see that? Okay. I don't see the whole question, so uh, I'm what not. What is your gonna... injection formula? Lidocaine, and I apologize, I might put dexamethasone. What doses? Also, do you find a difference in what steroid to use? Yeah, I, I think it doesn't make a huge difference which steroid you use. Um, I, I will do uh, a little marcaine and um, and steroid dexamethasone, um, 40 milligrams, one cc. That's what I use for the shoulder. It's a smaller joint than the knee. That's what I use. All right. Doesn't look like there's any more questions coming in. I guess we can say if anybody has any last minute questions that type them in here and we can get them answered. But if not, um, if you do think of, you know, anything after we, you know, log off tonight, you, you do have my email. I did put it in the chat box here. Um, I did put the number to call and make an appointment. I am happy to help assist make an appointment if you need one. Um, feel free to email me directly. You can also email marketing at rothmanortho.com. I have access to that email as well. We're happy to help. Um, all right. Well, thanks, Dr. Ramabat. Excellent Thank presentation. You. Have a nice night, everybody. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks, Natalie. Of course.